A postericular incision has been made and the mastoid has been removed along with the opening of the facial recess. You see the facial nerve, head of the stapes, and round window niche. We're going to remove the lip of the round window niche so that we can entirely visualize the round window membrane. And later on, we'll lift the round window membrane out of its annulus so that we can introduce the electrode system directly into the scale of tympani. A hole has now been placed in the mastoid tip and this will accept a stud. The stud has a square top that accepts the electrode button which will extend out through the skin. Each of the electrodes has a separate receptacle or socket so that we can introduce individual electronic circuits to each of the electrode endings. And we cover this entire button with a screw-on cover that can be kept in place after the healing has taken place. From the electrode button, the five wires lead to the electrode endings. At the end of the electrode system, the wire is turned over and then each of the other endings are twisted around the bundle of wires so that we can have exposed surfaces of the electrodes. This entire system is then introduced into the scale of tympani. We lift out the round window membrane and then slip the bundle of electrodes into the scale of tympani by pushing them around the convex area of the cochleum. In this way, we avoid damage to the basilar membrane. Once the entire five electrodes are introduced into the scale of tympani, we then allow the round window membrane to return to place so that it will heal and seal the electrodes into the scale of tympani. The electrode bundle of wires is then secured to the mastoid by suturing it in place to the periosteum. The postericular incision is closed and allowed to heal. Following the healing after the surgical procedure, we began a series of investigations in Jack Urban's laboratory which were to last over a period of three years. Now, the first thing we did was to plug in the electrodes into the button system, and in this way we were able to establish thresholds for pure tone stimuli. Okay, Jack, let's uh, plug these in. Now, the brown would be the number one electrode, which is this position right there. That's it. Okay, good. Brown right. is brown one. one. Red is number two. In July 1970, we began systematic exploration of the sound sensations produced by electronic signals. We had no knowledge of what these responses would be, and we had no preconceived theories as to which electronic signals would be best. We had simply designed a system to give maximum flexibility of signal stimulus and had the possibility of stimulating one to five different parts of the cochlea. We started with simple electronic waveforms and progressed over a period of two years to very complex electronic analogs of speech. We recognized that we would have to build waveform generators of increasing complexity as we gain more information. At all times, the safety of the patient was paramount. into the implant button, and we're going to now measure Mr. Grazer's threshold for electrical stimulation and also the type of current that he um, perceives, or that gives him a perception of sound, and we'll ask him to describe those tones as he hears them. All right. Okay. 
Would you uh, like to start out with a uh, 30 cycle? Uh, yeah, let's we'll start with 30 and then we'll All build right, up. We'll, now we have the, uh, we have it pre-programmed uh, pre here and we are now on the scale of one tenth of a volt per centimeter. Now we will inject this signal on, off. On, very thin. Off. During our investigation, we were very careful to be sure that all of our equipment was properly isolated. We used isolation transformers to supply all the necessary voltages for our equipment, and also we used isolation mats to protect Mr. Grazer from being in contact with the floor where he could possibly pick up some stray currents. Louder. Same kind of sound, but louder. On. Same. Oh. Right. Now shall we go to, uh, shall we go to 60 cycle? Right. On. It's more like singing. On. Not again. Off. Shall we try 90 cycle? Let's During this phase of the investigation, a very curious finding emerged. Previously, electronic testing of patients with normal inner ears during stapes or chronic ear surgery had always indicated stimuli of 1 to 4,000 cycles would be heard best. Grazer had no responses at these speech frequencies. Apparently, the absence of hair cells greatly changed the stimulation characteristics of the inner ear. Instead, he responded best to electronic signal frequencies of 30 to 120 and at a level of three-tenths of a volt. This finding, for which we still have no explanation, was confirmed in our other implant patients. It was confirmed week after week in testing, and we began to use this as our threshold measurement for electronic stimulation. We have been extremely pleased that the threshold of stimulation has remained at three-tenths of a volt at 90 cycles for each of the five electrodes strongly indicating that no harm has been done to the inner ear by repeated electrical stimulation. Go to fourth electrode, number four, the yellow electrode. Okay. Which is the second, second one for up from the round window. As the months wore on, there was no evidence of implant rejection, and we felt that the materials now being used had overcome the problem that caused rejection nine years earlier. Closest to the round window. All right. Um, that's a buzz at that time. It's louder. On. Um, that's again, like oh. a good alarm clock. Another curious finding was that the 90 cycle electronic signal put into the electrode closest to the round window gave a sensation of a higher frequency sound than the same 90 cycle signal when it was put into the electrode 20 millimeters into the scale of timpani. Above 120 cycles, the response decreased considerably until we got up to a range of 12 to 18,000 cycles. For some reason, he liked the sensation produced by the stimulus, but he found it difficult to describe. We found that putting in a 16,000 cycle stimulus in one electrode and a 1,000 cycle stimulus in another electrode allowed him to hear a response for the 1,000 cycle stimulus. This has proven to be a very important observation. We feel that the high frequency signal somehow sensitizes the inner ear to signals in the speech range. On. There's some, that's back to very faint high-pitched whistle. After many months of testing, we felt we were ready for the next step. On. A stimulus generator with a carrier frequency and speech modulation. This unit required about three months to build. It had the capabilities of modulating a given carrier wave with audio. If Charles Grazer was to hear speech, he would have to respond to the range of speech audio vibrations. The range of speech sound vibrations is 500 cycles to 3,000 cycles. 
its control. We built this device to convert sound into corresponding electronic signals and then superimpose them on a carrier wave. We could also reduce the frequencies, or electronically speaking, we could count them down. This meant that we could bring these frequencies down into the area of Grazer's best response. This was the area of 30 to 120 cycles per second. For example, if we use the 10 times reduction, we could bring the 500 cycles down to 50 and the 3,000 cycles down to 300. We could select various combinations of electrodes, such as 1 to 6 or 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, and so on. After some time spent in testing with this unit, Mr. Grazer's response was not very satisfactory, so we decided to build another unit that would give us more capabilities and permit us to insert more complex signals. This unit took us approximately five months or so to build, and it enabled us to insert many more complex signals. We felt that we needed greater flexibility to put different parts of the speech signals into different parts of the inner ear. This, after all, is the way the normal ear analyzes sound, the high frequencies being heard at the round window and the low frequencies at the apex of the cochlea. This piece of Jack Urban's electronic wizardry makes it possible to put various bands of the speech frequencies into separate electrodes, either with or without a carrier wave, and also to count down these frequencies at the same time. Same could be done with all of the various bandpass filters. We also had the ability to divide this entire ratio down by a factor of two again, making it possible to divide the signal down from one to 22.